We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and that was Zanvort. Zanvort. How many times can we ha- say Zanvort in this episode? That's what I want to know. That's a great question. And, you know, honestly, like, it was not a great race. Like, it's great that F1 is back, but, like, that was, that, like, n- that race is not going to be, like, one of my, like, top five of the year. No, I don't think so at all. But, like, we were talking about in our DMs, you know, prior to the race, the Dutch put on a great Grand Prix. Oh, yeah. It, it is. It's entertaining. There's lots going on. I love the Dutch flag throughout the grandstand. Like, it's a very, I think, fan friendly race to attend but yeah for the I viewers and agree. even like someone sitting there watching the actual race I think it's maybe a little yeah the, well like the race itself and I was telling you this before we started recording is like I was watching the F1 Academy races after I had my, my typical post-race nap which is really nice to you know wake up move to the couch watch the race and then go back to bed for a little bit <laughs> um but um, watching the F1 Academy races, I was like, the F1 Academy races had like things happening throughout the entire time, even though the race leaders, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but like the race leaders were way ahead. Whereas like, yeah, Lando ran off for 20, like ahead by 22 seconds, which is, I don't personally have a problem with that because that's what Max had been doing for the last two years. But it was, it, I, I just really felt like there wasn't anything to make up for the lack of action at the front with the Formula One race. No, I completely agree. And I know we're going to talk about it later and we have some non-Dutch Grand Prix stuff to cover too. But no, I completely agree. It was not my top five. Maybe not even top 10. And we've only had like 14 races. So The 15. 15. 15. This is 15. I will never know, Catherine. Until the season's over, I'll never know what race number we're on. And that's just a fact I've accepted. (laughs) And I will know because that's how I use it in our naming (laughs) conventions when I'm saving all of our episode data. (laughs) I know, I know. Well, before we get too deep into the race and our thoughts on it, we get to talk about contracts in a timely fashion and order, which is, yay, Emily's favorite thing. So, Jack Dewan was announced as the second Alpine driver for 2025. Catherine and I both predicted this way early on when we did our early predictions episode. We both, I I think I'm pretty, fairly certain we both picked Jack to fill that Alpine seat. If it wasn't going to be the two Frenchmen um, right. returning. Yeah. Caveat of that. Um, so this is the first move from the new team principal, Oliver Oaks, who took over, <laughs> you know, at Spa. <laughs> Again. <Right>. Oops. <laughs> Classic Alpine. Um, but this is really exciting. He joined the Alpine Academy in 2022, and he's been their re- reserve driver since 2023. Um, and in 2023, he finished third in F2. So he does have experience. He's done a ton of the young driver sessions for Alpine both last year and he'll do them again this year before taking the seat next year. So that's really exciting. And this is probably like me making a much bigger deal out of it than I need to. But when Martin Brundle grabbed him on the, um, gridwalk. Thank you. I can never remember that. Grid block. Uh, he was talking about his dad. And and Jack's, like, whole thing was just saying, like, yeah, my dad's really happy. Really excited to do this for my dad. And I'm like, okay, so we have a, moto, uh, you know, motorsport Nepo baby, which is fine. Great. So is Carlos. So, you know, so is Max. It runs in the family, it seems like. But the whole yeah. interview just screamed, like, I'm only doing this to make my dad happy. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I I fully agree. And like, you know, Mick Dewan is a a huge name in like motorcycle racing, five time champion, etc, cetera, etc, cetera. like huge deal. But yeah, yeah, J- Jack for all that Jack is like, like he's been working towards getting to Formula One forever. He's been waiting in the wings at Alpine forever. He's actually the first driver to make it out of the like Alpine Academy, which has been a few different names back when it was like Renault and Lotus since 2009 when Roman Grosjean got onto the F1 grid. So it's been a minute since they've had a young driver actually make it to Formula One. Obviously, Oscar Piastri was supposed to be that guy, but Alpine, as we all know, is kind of a hot mess behind not so closed doors. 
So it's like, it's very exciting for him. It's also probably like really wild for, for Jack that like, this is actually happening and you know, that like this, it's going to be here for him. Like this isn't just another one of the maybe next year type of deals. Yeah. And like, I'm very excited for him and he did seem excited. Just his whole response and answer was like, my dad wants this for me and I'm happy yeah. that my dad got his wish. And I'm like, yeah, Alpi needs to get him into media training right away. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they need to do some, some of, of that for him, but yeah. It, and, and people are saying like, well, this is kind of the best that Alpine could have done. And, and yeah, it, it, kind of is but at the same time the best that Alpine could have done is a really good driver who for all that their car is not good but will be better next year especially when they probably have a new engine supplier this is going to be a really good move for them and and will give them somebody who has a lot of experience with these cars with this program to you know be able to, you know, kind of hit the ground running in a way that we don't often see from rookies and that we probably won't see from, you know, Ollie Behrman or probably rookie that will be announced next week, Kimi Antonelli. Right. So that was what I was going to say next is now we have three seats left. So V-Car, Mercedes and Stake, but kind of not Mercedes because Toto, like 99.9% confirmed that Kimi Antonelli is going to be driving for Mercedes in 2025. And we've already talked about how he's going to driving in FP1 in Monza in his home yes. race. <laughs> but it also would not be surprising if they announce at Monza that he's driving in front of the Tifosi in 2025 for Mercedes. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's what's going to happen is, is we're going to put the episode out and then like an hour later, they're going to announce that it's official because um, that's what happens <laughs> every time we put an, <laughs> put an announcement out. It happened when Kevin Magnuson was going to leave Haas. It happened with, with Esteban Ocon taking his we seat. We need to start it's- taking bets, Catherine, at the end of the episode. Like what's one of our things that we were talking about, like potentially happening, like which one's actually going to drop right after the episode? That's right. So it's, this time off. it's going, it's definitely going to be, you know, Antonelli. <laughs> I mean, Toto, Toto said in, in an interview, he was like, our drivers next year that we're going to be supporting George and Kimmy. So like, we know this is happening. Right. But then like, when he was asked about it after that, he just like ignored everybody and like, Oh, he's like, anything. Oh crap. I did. I wasn't supposed to say that. Well, and then, so, and I don't know if this was a cover up by Susie or not, but also Martin grabbed her on the grid walk yeah. and was asking like how things were going. And she was like, Oh, he's having a really hard weekend. It's really stressful. And then she's like, because of qualifying yesterday. <laughs> yeah. And like there was a hesitation. And I didn't know if it was because of like the slip up that he was stressed and like having to deal with all that fallout or if it truly was qualifying. But like George didn't qualify terribly. But was, Lewis like, was terrible. It was 12. Like, it's not the best, but it's not like... Well, then he got the penalty, and so he did start 15th. Right, right, exactly. So it's not like... But that's not something for Toto to have, like, a really incredible stressful weekend. So I was like, Susie, I see you, girl. Yeah, I just... Love seeing Susie on the grid. Yeah. Speaking of of the the other side of, of the pit lane from from Mercedes, Haas has been in some like really fun legal hot water all weekend long, and this has just been like an absolute adventure. And you know it's like ridiculous and actually a problem because Gene Haas, who doesn't go to races in Europe, like he's never at you know non American races. No. He was there. Like I saw him. I, I turned on the TV this morning, and like he was the first thing that I saw. And my dad texted me. He's like, "Oh, looks like Gene's here to deal with the uh, your collie drama." Well, and he this was. This is like one of the two things that I don't understand that happened in Sanford. Like this whole legal hot water thing. I understand where they're coming from, but Haas is an American team. There are sanctions in place against Russian and Belarusian companies, people, individuals. So, like, did Haas not go about it the super PC way of just, like, spending the money? So, Absolutely. But at the same time, like, they couldn't do anything about it. Right. They, they could, they they couldn't make it. It's not easy for them. Like, legally, it's not, not easy. Like, so... 
a, you need a, a middleman and you need you need a middleman yeah. it's a, a, there's a middle eastern bank account involved according to the autosport article that i read but basically for those of you who don't know what's going on um your kali is a russian fertilizer company that is owned by nikita mazepin's father um who obviously nikita mazepin is one of the worst drivers in formula one history he drove for haas because haas needed money um and we and throw him under the bus Catherine. absolutely gonna and oh, Nikita Mazepin's dad was willing to pony up and then, you know, Russia decided to start a war and every, and Haas said, we can't be involved with you because we're American, among other things. And there was a lot of legal stuff. And basically a Swiss court said that Haas was right to break the partnership and break right. the contract, but also you have to give them the, the, the money that you didn't spend back to your colleague, um, which out of the $13 million was about $9 million. Now, as you said, Haas is an American company, can't legally pay your colleague because of sanctions. I don't know if Mazepin specifically is sanctioned, Mazepin's dad, Mazepin. He is. Um, he, okay, so he yeah. is. I, I, I didn't remember if he was specifically sanctioned. He was. Uh, but he he is definitely one of like Putin's buddy boys. So like he's, he's up there in, in the hierarchy. Basically, a Dutch court said that Haas could not leave the track until the money was paid the money did get paid over this weekend but because of weekends and because people you know like courts are typical nine to fivers so um Haas can't actually leave Zandvoort can't leave the track right now until the courts open as you're listening to this this will have been resolved but you know as we record it's Sunday afternoon Sunday evening so they they won't be able to leave until the courts open up and you know, confirm that the money from Haas is in this Middle Eastern bank account that will be accessible to, um, you know, the, our bu buddies in Russia. This doesn't sound sketchy at all. Oh, no, this is super sketchy. But also this to is clarify, like, the people of Haas can leave. They're not being held hostage. It's yeah. the assets of Haas, so like their cars. <laughs> Just yeah, like to the, clarify, because when you when you say like Haas can't leave, it's like they're all just right. like being held against their will in this small garage. But no, it's just Honestly. the assets of Haas, so the cars they won't. Yes, leave. like the car. Well, the cars, the equipment, yeah. the you know, a, a, the, all the stuff that they use to make their hospitality. Like none of that can go anywhere until Monday morning when the court scope open up and confirm that this you know sketchy middleman whoever they're using to back channel money into you know this company which i'm sure the u.s is thrilled about either way right. um like this all just screams like nikita mazapan's dad is needing money and struggling like that's what it screams because why would Probably. you go like it happened it wasn't like so long ago but it was year a few years ago it's been three and they years just, like keep going after this and it just seems like a strange time of like it all coming down to like the Dutch Grand Prix. Yeah, well, I mean, like, why couldn't you handle this in the summer break? Probably because the assets were not in well, an, part in a looser court. Maybe I don't know. Pro they, they they probably had more you know friend you know more of an ability to get a response that was favorable to them in, in the Netherlands. But the also the other thing is that like they were all of this litigation has been going on for a couple of years now and right. only just has been resolved. Like the Swiss That's court fair. said in, it's only been a few months since the court gave Haas this deadline of when to pay. It's only been a few months of, you know, Mazepin and your colleague being impatient of, you know, getting their money. But you're probably right. You know, I, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm not an economist. I don't know how things are looking in Russia, but I don't think that they're looking all that great. Yeah. I mean, Nine million dollars is a lot, I guess. And Just I'm sure in, in on Russia money, relative. it's 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 also like a lot, a lot. Because I'm I'm not an economist, but I'm sure that inflation is pretty high in Russia right now. Yeah. Oh well. But anyway, love geopolitics. Are we ready to get into racing? <laughs> <laughs> Such as it was Here today. The yes. Podcast. We go all the way off track and come all the way back. Way back on. <laughs> okay, we're we're just you know. Um, K magsing it, going into the gravel, finding our escape route, and finding our way back to the track. Yeah. So here we are. Dutch Grand yeah. Prix 2024. So Lando won. Let's just pause. Standing ovation. Round of applause. Yeah. So excited. I did for Lando. say that he was going to win his second race before the summer break, so I was one race off. You're still wrong. I mean, I'm still <laughs> no, wrong. But, but we, both we knew it was said... gonna happen. 
Right, and we both said at the very beginning when we made our predictions, Lando is going to get his first win this season, and possibly, and probably more. Like we right. called that he is going to be a multi race winner this year. Just we weren't one hundred percent positive when it would happen. I'm glad it happened now. The race in constructors is about to get wild. Oh Catherine. yeah, like we have so yeah. many races coming up. I was looking at the calendar, and I'm just like. And, like, Monza, too, if you don't qualify well, you're screwed. So I'm right. not – I don't have a lot of, you know, faith in, in Checo and how Red Bull is going to go. So – No, I mean, there's only – so. Yeah, there, there's there's not that much of a margin. But I mean, between the the top three teams, as we as we said right. going into the weekend, you know, Red Bull right now they have 434 points. McLaren has just breached 400. They have 404, and then you've got Ferrari at 370. You know, right behind. So there, you know, there's a lot of pressure right now, and Sergio Perez needs to get his ish together if he's going to help Red Bull with anything. Which, as we said, the fact that Red Bull has chosen to keep Perez means that they're handing the constructors championship to McLaren. In my opinion also just to like sidebar off track this how brutal were the presenters to check out this whole all weekend, weekend long yeah oh my gosh they were trashing him and talking down so poorly about how red bull decided to keep him and like how horrible of a mistake this was and i'm just like damn this is brutal like i know it's not the choice everyone would have made but i don't think i've ever seen sky sports people be outrightly against a decision like that yeah they're, they're, well I mean there's there's a lot of questioning about it from everyone because everybody's like oh it's gonna be a done deal and it's like is is you know is Lawson gonna go to v carb for for Danny's seat and and or is he gonna go you know for for Checo's seat or is Danny gonna go to to Red Bull you know that was the, that was what the question was and then all of a sudden Red Bull wakes up Monday morning and says no Checo's our guy yeah and like part of it is understandable and and you you've even made this point Emily of like better the devil you know and the devil who who has scored podiums in one races than the devil who, you know, Danny has not won in a while. And, you know, Lawson is is for the most part, technically brand new to formula one. So, you know, but devil, you know, devil, you don't, is it worth it to try to get somebody in for the last nine, 10 races of the year? So at the same time, Red Bull is just kind of sitting there and saying like, well, this is a wash and we're just going to probably, you know, tear up this two year contract of Paris and do something different going into 2025. Yeah. I don't know. It's. Hi, Winston. Apologies. Um, but yeah, but Lando won. He had a really great race. He won Other by than 20 the seconds. start line. Other than the start I've noticed, and maybe it's just me, and maybe it's just looking at this race, he doesn't start great. Like, he doesn't have great reaction time. No, and you know what's 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 interesting to me is is two things are interesting to me. One is that this is actually very similar to Max because Max for a very long time until actually like this season has never been great off the line. Like right. th- like Max off the line today was probably one of his best starts in his career. And then the second thing that's funny to me is that like McLaren's like, oh no, he doesn't have an issue getting off the starting line, and we're all like. Yes, he does. Mm. We see it. We're watching what you're watching. And he blew that pretty not bad. <laughs> like not buying it. And it, Oscar had the same issue with wheel spin. So maybe some like some of it could just be the car right. and the way that, you know, the way that they would warm up the tires and things like that. But also Lando needs to work on his starts. Yeah. So you brought up Max Verstappen. He had a better start than Lando, but like that's all he had going for him. The car well, yeah, the Red Bull doesn't have the pace right now. No, they don't. And we were talking about this before recording, too. All of our best conversations happen on, on right. camera and off record. Um, but they have not brought upgrades yet. So McLaren brought a ton of upgrades. So they were, like, kind of semi-even, I would say, going into summer break, maybe. Maybe the McLaren was a McLaren little was bit a little faster. Ahead. But not by much. But they brought a ton of upgrades. So they're, like, way up here now. And the Red Bull's still sitting there. They haven't brought upgrades yet. I don't know if they're bringing them to Monza or if they've just stopped the evolution and growth of this car for the year. But I would I don't think, think they still d- need to bring upgrades for the rest of the year. I don't think they're done yet. So the, Red Bull has a couple of problems. Number number one, 
you know, the Red Bull looked the same as it did before the summer break because the summer break silly season is also known as the summer shutdown. And for, for those of you who, who are, you know, newer to Formula One and or, you know, don't really, you know, remember, you know, the summer shutdowns means you don't work on the cars. Nobody has worked on the cars since before the summer break. So, you know, it doesn't surprise me at all that Red Bull ran into the same problems that they've been having for the last few races because nothing has changed on the car. So do I expect to see something different, you know, going into Monza? Yes. Right. And to also help clarify that point, McLaren had these upgrades ready to go prior to the summer. Break. Right. So the summer shutdown isn't just like, oh, no one's working. We have time off. Like, you can't work on the car during yeah. the summer shutdown. It is like everyone breaks. No work is being done. Take your hops. Take your summer holiday. Rent go, be on, go be on a yacht. And then the <laughs> other issue that Red Bull has, before I forget, is that Checo Perez has had a lot of costly crashes right and yeah. that all factors into the budget like all those repairs to Perez's car factor into the budget cap we are in the budget cap era um and unless Red Bull wants to blame it on the catering again they're not going to be you know breaking you know the, the budget cap and exceeding it so there's really only so much that they can do from a developmental standpoint for the rest of the season thanks to you know Par you know Perez is you know screwing the team over left right and center Right, and and I wouldn't be surprised if Max gets all the upgrades and they, like, barely upgrade Checo's car for the year. Probably. Because, like, if you look at Williams, they're a really good example. Logan Sargent. Everything goes to Alex. He has, you know, not trash, but he has crashed his car a lot this season, which has taken a lot of money from their development budget. And so all the upgrades generally go to Alex, and they'll wait, like, a race weekend or two to make sure that Logan has clean races and then they'll bring upgrades to Logan's car. So that's, I mean, that's not the only reason why Logan generally falls lower than Alex, but that's just how they have to structure it because of all of the, you know, issues that Logan has at this season. I mean, Williams has issues and, and we'll get there oh, in course, a minute, but, but yeah, but, but you're also, you're also right. And then to, to round out our podium and to talk about our top three, um, didn't see this coming, did not have this on my bingo card. Where the heck did Charles Leclerc come from? Honestly, I think it's just because he qualified well. Like that's yeah. it. Cause he, well, I mean, he qualified P six and then is able to take advantage a little bit. And Ferrari did have like a good couple moments in strategy. strategy. Um, but at the same time, it's like, wait, why are you in P three? Like, and this go yeah this kind of goes to what we've said is that oscar kind of got screwed this weekend which i think is fair to say but a six one way half dozen the other if they would have pitted him a little bit differently maybe he would have gotten p3 i think he definitely had the pace to pass charles but i don't know it just didn't happen at the end so right it, like i think it should have been lando max oscar yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, I think, I think so too. I just I like, think I Charles got lucky, but Charles, Charles got lucky, but like the, when I, I said, said this earlier, like the, the top of the field didn't, you know, there wasn't really much happening there. You know, Lando yeah. went off, Max was in no man's land and they were kind of talking on the broadcast of like, Oh, Leclerc's going to get Max. And I'm like, no, cause he's been maintaining a six second lead for like five laps now and it's yeah. not you know he's not cutting into it all that much so it's like I know that you want to manufacture more drama about like what's going on with Max but you know unless something happens that causes a safety car Max is probably not going to lose P2 no. um, but then also the same like Charles was really not at much you know threat by Oscar really at all through throughout the um, throughout that the tail end of that race and it, like there there's really not much going on up front at all or like anywhere else no it was it was very much a exciting race watching Lando chase Max and then Lando overtook and then just walked Bye. away with it. Um but that was really it. Like there wasn't a ton of big crazy amazing overtakes. Like well Carlos had some really good overtakes. Let's put that out there. But it was it was kind of a very just meh race no the the uh, the only other thing and you know heaven forbid i ever say anything nice about lewis hamilton but lewis hamilton really did carve his way through the field um and you know he started you know p15 on a track that is not you know the easiest to overtake on and ended up in the points at p8 and honestly had the race gone on much longer the team would have asked george to move aside so lewis could get after perez because lewis did probably have the pace to overtake him 
I wasn't gonna steal your thunder on on that. I know you weren't. The Lewis, I know the Lewis Hamilton piece. So I know. I know. For those of you listening who make fun of this moment where Catherine has to talk good about Lewis, I hope you're there. You you're, welcome. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're <laughs> welcome. Um, but yeah, I, and that's the thing too. I think they focused on so. I didn't love the broadcasting today either. I think they focused on so many other things. Like I didn't even realize how far up Lewis was coming because he like was never on. And I don't know. I, I missed that until like the very end. Yeah. To, to speak on the broadcast real quick, I was, I did like the gimbal camera that they put on Lando's it was car. Cool. I loved it that. And dizzy. like, but it was cool. It it was it was a little a little bit, but it was like very much it it was really perfect for that track because no, it doesn't necessarily convey exactly how it feels to be driving because that's really what you have the helmet cams for. Right. But it was like on a track like Zanvoort that has such steep banking, I just thought that it was really cool just to like see how much the car is going and going and wooing um, and moving around, you know, as they go on the track, like the, the final turn, turn 14 going onto the, the, you know, the pit straight is one of like the coolest, most fun turns on this track. So I just thought it was like, that was a really cool addition from the broadcast, but I also agree like the broadcast, like they missed a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So they were on like, the broadcasting in general was on my like not great of the weekend but this is the second thing of the weekend i don't understand going into like who kind of i don't want to say disappointed shot the bed, but disappointed i guess is a more pc way to say it but i would say they really shit the bed with this like williams made a car that was not legal i understand like it's millimeters too wide so very very small but this goes back to the argument i make about absolutely everything so many people have eyes on this stuff and everyone knows the regulation. So how do you make a car prior to racing, right? That is not in regulations. Like going back to Coda last year when two people got disqualified because their floor was too thin. The skid like, planks. The skid plank was too thin. Like that I understand a little bit because of driving and wear throughout the race weekend. But this was like, I, just, I don't understand how a mistake like this is made. Yeah, and there there were a couple really interesting things about this, and I I I, I messaged this to you this morning during the grid walk of like because I didn't really like I to to be fair I also didn't like look into it very hard because I was like I'll wait for it you know I'll I'll wait to look into it you know when I'm doing the rundown but I was like what does you know the floor exceeding volume mean and then Martin Brundle found Pat Fry who's one of the top guys at Williams and was like what happened and he's like well the floor was a little too wide I was like oh. That was the problem the entire time was that the floor in one spot on the car was slightly too wide um, by like less than a millimeter. So this is like some, this like the margins are like razor thin. And then I also, I read that like Williams measured it, but from Williams own measurements, it was legal. So who was doing the measuring? How was the measuring calculated that got it wrong compared to the FIA? So someone's getting fired. Basically. So someone's getting That's fired. Yeah. I mean, again, it's not like it was egregious. It's very minuscule how off it was. And that, but it, it doesn't come down to inches. It comes down to millimeters in F1. So that's just. Yeah. The fact that this literally was fixed by buffing that portion of the, like the floor out with sandpaper, right. according to, to James Vowles. And like, also this was a James Vowles radio weekend, which was so unfortunate because as, as you know, if you've listened to this podcast, we love when James Vowles is the team principal on the sky broadcast. And like, this was the worst weekend for it because yeah. we had Alex being disqualified from qualifying Logan Sargent destroying not, his car in FP3 and not even being in qualifying. Um, and like, like all of this and then William just you know doing nothing during during the race like this like this was really very unfortunate um that like this this was the the weekend that James was on the radio I know he makes really hard technical stuff so fascinating really fascinating and super easy to understand 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, they didn't, it wasn't the, the James weekend I was hoping for. And now we probably no. won't get a James weekend until like the second to last race of the season. Oh, so. I know it's going to take forever, but yeah. And then to, to speak about Logan Sargent, who also really disappointed this weekend, you know, he, the, there have been rumors and like these rumors kind of pop up like every 20 minutes of like James Vows is going to replace him for the rest of the season. Um, but, and I was talking to my dad about this yesterday. I don't think Williams is good enough as a team to warrant them bothering to change out the drivers at this See, point. And I of disagree. The year. I disagree. Okay. Because I don't, I don't think they can afford to keep, to keep him. Yeah. Meaning like, look at all the damage he's done so far with the car. Williams is not, I mean, obviously we're all under budget cap, right? But they need that development money and they need that money to go towards developing the car. And if they just keep hitting roadblocks with Logan or, you know, barriers, I don't think they can, they can get anything out of the season. And, and I recognize like they're not good enough and maybe it doesn't matter, but they're just blowing money away at this point. And they're not a huge team to just have all these massive funds and like, oh, well, it is what it is. Yeah, I know that. I mean, that that's a good point. I just, I don't feel like that, like, because the only other option right now that I think that could replace Sargent would be probably Mick Schumacher. Um, oh, I would say Ollie Behrman. Yeah, I don't think that they, I don't think they can take Ollie Behrman because of his, like his, you know, his, his contract, contract is for... Well, his next. contract is for next year, but he's not like Kimmy he doesn't Antonelli. have the same part. Throw him in, get it him right. Could, it could be Antonelli, and it it could be Antonelli based off of his performance oh, in FP one no, next week. It couldn't be Ollie Behrman. I was I'm thinking Haas. He could have gone to Haas. Yeah, he no, could have gone this to is Williams. Oh my god. Yeah, and throw Kimmy in there. Let's see how he does. Yeah. So I mean, or it, Mick. It, Mick it, Schumacher is a safe bet. Mick Schumacher is a safe bet. Like, I don't think that it would be all that much better with him in the car versus, you know, Sargent. I think that Mick could potentially crash less. So he was pretty crash happy when he was driving for Haas. Um, I just, I don't really think that anybody's looking very seriously at Mick right now. Which makes me so mad. All I want I is for him to come back to the grid. I know, I know. But, but yeah, I just, I don't, I like you, you say that Williams can't afford to keep Sargent. I say that they're just not going to, you know, they're, they, they're not going to bother because it won't like, it won't be enough of a net positive. And so I think that we'll see, um, but it wouldn't surprise me if Sargent does, you know, limp through the end of the season. I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to see. And last but not least, Yuki. So the, I think it was Crofty was saying how he has to like, just destroy Danny or Danny has to destroy him this season, like for anything to happen with the Red Bull seat next year, because we're all assuming that Checo is not driving for Red Bull. I don't necessarily agree where Danny has to destroy Yuki. I just think he needs to like really show that he's better than Yuki because the first I'd say third of the season, Yuki was out pointing and out driving Danny. And I feel oh, like Danny's kind of like coming back now. So um, Yugi had a pretty disappointing race. He qualified P12, which is, you know, kind of in the that range of where he qualifies. But And then he, you know, will kind of go up a few, but he fell back to P17 and he was like down there early. It's not like yeah. he, you know, wasn't, wasn't making it, didn't find pace. He like throughout the race, it was early where he dropped. Yeah, no, I was I was actually shocked at like how like I didn't even like the broadcast other than at the beginning when when Yuki was holding up Lewis, like they didn't show Yuki at all. And no. then I was looking at the results is like, oh, wow, Yuki finished P17. Like he's he was on the in the back of the bus, like with the, the Saubers who are P19 and 20, right. um, which also the Saubers were, were terrible, but we knew that they were going to be terrible. So it's not really a Kevin disappointment. Terrible every weekend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know what I was thinking with my P10 pick, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But like, you know, you're right. Like this, you know, the fact that Danny finished in the the position that Yuki qualified like that's what Danny needs to keep doing in order to you know either keep his seat at RB or you know move you know back up and in, into Red Bull whatever is going to happen next year but yeah I was just I was really I did not see that coming out, out of out of Yuki today no I didn't I did not but very unfortunate yeah I don't know I think I had a lot of, like higher hopes for V-Carb this year they're just oh fully 
really disappointing. They're almost worse than Alphatari was last season. They were not good last season, so. Um, I think points wise they're ahead but it's purely just because it it. does it doesn't seem like it and it doesn't seem like it based on like everything that we had heard about how the relationship between Red Bull and VCAR was going to be a lot closer this year and obviously that they're you know they're two separate teams and there are rules about you know how much one team can help another out even when they're in the same stable but we you really expected based off of what happened last year that that VCARB was going to be in a better position that they are now. And that, you know, to, to be said, they're, where are they in the constructors? They are P6 in the constructors championship. Right, which isn't bad. It's it, like, and I think it's the sneaky points that like, to me, it seems like they're so low, but we, I forget, like we have steak and we have Williams who are, who have you know, barely Haas, any- who, Haas is only seven points back. They've been struggling lately, but sometimes they do manage to get like points here and there. They just haven't, you know, haven't for a while. But yeah, it's, it's really easy to forget that, that that's where, you know, RB is because we're so focused on like constructor wise, like the front of the grid right now. But yeah, I I expected the relationship to be better too. Right. And, and speaking of the relationship, I think, I mean, this car for this year was pretty much already developed when they decided like, Hey, we should work more in unison. Yeah. Um so I think next season would will be a bigger season for V Carb than this season. With that relationship Could be. and partnership. But yeah. like you said, they can only share so much. So Yeah, it's like the those the the lines between sharing, like obviously Zach Brown, anytime you mention that there's a relationship between, you know, Haas and Ferrari or Red Bull and V Carb, he gets up in arms about, you know, secrets and sharing and how it's bad for and destroying the sport. So like, you know, we have you Excuse know, there, me while I break my eye sockets from rolling them so right, hard. Right, exactly. Like there there's you know, there there's only so much of that that's like actually happening. But yeah, I, I expected V Carb to, to be better than their performing and to you know say that they're you know they're they're still p6 in the championship and they're seven points ahead of Haas yeah there's always next season yep well I think that's all I really want to talk about but we can jump into our predictions and how horribly we want it oh yeah so no points for either of us zero big fat whop and zero I I could have sworn Catherine I had three points I was so excited I was like Wow, I got three points. I picked Fernando. And you're like, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. But you know what happened? I had Fernando as my P10. And I had, I also had Lando as my pole. And then when we were talking about weather and like how it was going to be crazy all weekend, I changed it because of the weather. And then the weather like had zero bearing on anything all weekend. So go to Yeah. Anyways, jumping into it. So Catherine and I predict pole, podium, and P10. We do that in our prediction episode, which comes out before race weekend. In our recap, we see how many points we got. We both did Didn't get any. So we got zero. So for pole, you picked Oscar. I picked Max. We were both wrong. It was Lando. Very yep. happy for Lando. And then podium was Lando, Max, Charles. You had Max, Oscar, Carlos. I had Max, Lando, Oscar. So we were both very far off. Which is fine. I did pick a Ferrari driver. Just happened to be the wrong. You Ferrari had the wrong driver. Ferrari driver, the wrong McLaren wrong driver, McLaren and, and the wrong, wrong order. So I'm going to say you really. <laughs> it was still a swing and a miss. <laughs> Oh We're yeah, not fully. Much credit on that one. None. Well, here I get even less credit for my P10 pick because the guy that I picked P10 finished P19. Close enough. Yeah, so for P10, it was Fernando Alonso. You picked Botas, who was P19. I picked Charles Leclerc, who was P3. We're both like, we split the distance of like how far we could get from P10, actually. That's what we're going to do. Let's pick the person who's furthest from P10. (laughs) So we either have to pick P20 or P20. I will go P20 every single time. Joe Kwan, you are my guy. That's what I have to do. I have to start picking Joe Kwan, you for P20, and then he'll get like P9. And then we can keep him on on the grid for next season. I swear, I'm I don't know about that fan. I know you are. If there's no more fans for Shogun on you, it's because I'm dead. Because I'm his number one fan. Okay, so and then for biggest surprise and who's gonna do a dumb just for funsies, Catherine, you had double points for V Carb, and like we just said, nope. uh, Yuki had a stressful weekend. Not stressful, but just underperformed. Um, and did not get points, and neither did Danny. But Danny did finish in P12, which is a good finish for him. And I said that he was gonna have a good weekend, and I would say yes, I would say P12 is higher 
than I thought he was going to get. Also, on the talk of Danny, did you see him waving at the corner? Yes. <laughs> yes. Or, or he yes. broke his hand. Like, oh, thank you. Remember I think somebody. Somebody, I think it was Martin, said, like, that's not the gesture I would have expected him to to give to that, that oh, no, I was part of the like, wall. Full middle finger. Flip off the wall, yeah. That yeah. would have been funny, but I think he probably would have been yelled at if he did. Maybe. Um, and yeah. then for who's going to do a dom, you said Perez was going to be in P8 or below. Um, technically, no. Technically, no. For for the metrics that we chose for a bad weekend for Perez, no, he didn't meet our personal metrics as two random Formula One fans in the United States. But he qualified P5. He finished P6. He didn't do jack all race. So, like, technically he didn't, but also he kind of did. Yeah. I don't think it was a great race for him, especially where he qualified. Like, he should have done better, but... Whatever. Yeah, he should he should have been like up in P four, not down in P six. So again, the weather got me on my who's gonna do a dumb because I said that Ferrari was gonna set their car up one way Saturday for qualifying and it was screwed them over for Sunday. They actually didn't do bad. They had no. a solid strategy with Charles. Uh, Carlos didn't qualify well, but he, you know, finished in the points, which is good for him from where he was at. So all in all, great, great job for Ferrari. Yeah, hopefully they can bring I'm this consistency into the... As a Ferrari fan, like, I don't know why I'm sad that they're finally getting it together. Maybe because they... Maybe because it means if they get it together this weekend, that means they're going to screw themselves over at home in front of the Tifosi. Last year in Monza was my favorite race of the year, and I just know it's going to be such a disappointment this year. They can't have two good, se- two good Monza weekends in a, in no, a row. No, I don't think so. Well, now we are at our F1 Academy update. So Catherine, hit us with all of things F1 Academy from this weekend. Okay, so this was actually a pretty big weekend for F1 Academy. Um, Among other um, things, their first race of the weekend was postponed due to rain. So they had to like sneak it in Sunday morning, like an hour and a half before their second race. So it was pretty wild. But the biggest part of um, the F1 Academy weekend this weekend was their wild card driver, Nita Gaidman. Like she tore it up she had the yeah. best qualifying of a wild card driver she's um qualified p6 for both races she finished p4 in the first race and p10 in race two um she would have finished higher but she was given a 10 second penalty for causing a collision so it was a little unfortunate but she was driving amazing like most of the se- like the first half of the second race was focused on her and her fight between um, Hamda Alkobesi, um, who's one of the Red Bull drivers, and um, Aurelia Nobles, who I don't, <laughs> I think she's driving the Puma car. But it was like, she was driving so well. Susie Wolf has, has you know, r- uh, rumored to want her to be on the grid as an Academy driver next season. Like, this is the reason why we have wildcard drivers. And this was really freaking cool. Like, love to see it, Want want her back on. Yeah, no, this is super exciting. And it's nice to see a wildcard driver do well to say like, oh, this program and the way we have this set up is helping us farm new talent for next year because F1 Academy will bounce you out. It's it's li- limited. You have two years and then yeah, you're yeah. done. And so it's helping, you know, find that talent around the world where the races are. I think it's a great thing that they do this wildcard. Yeah, I I agree. And the other thing to to know is that a lot of these drivers are pretty relatively new to open wheel single seater, you know, track racing. Like if you look at Leah Block, who's the Williams driver, like this is her first season in this type of car and in this type of racing style because she does like a lot of like rallying um, and that's what she like grew up learning. So this is a completely new thing for a lot of these drivers. And then you have Gabeman who is, you know, she's pretty young in her, her single seater, you know, career. Um, but she's really good. Like this is the exact type of talent that you want in F1 Academy that you can continue to, you know, train and then bring into the other lower series like Formula Regional. A lot of these drivers right now are in British F4, including Gaidman, who is very familiar with all of this and is also familiar with Zandvoort. She's also a Dutch driver. So of course she's familiar with Zandvoort. But I I think that this is one of the best wildcard drivers we've seen. And like, and also one of the best full weekends for a wildcard card driver. We've never had a driver finished in the top 10 in both um, races in a weekend and she's currently 12th in the championship on her own in one weekend good for her that's yeah. exciting 
Yeah. So really exciting, really cool. From who actually won the race standpoint, race one, which was the shorter race, um, Abby Pulling has continued her dominance. She's killing it. Um, Nerea Marti, who's the Tommy Hilfiger driver, she was in P2 of race one. And then Maya Vuk, who we haven't really seen much in the last few races, who's a Ferrari driver, she made, made it back onto the podium. It's also her home race because she's also Dutch. And then Dorian Pond, who we thought would you know also be battling in the, the front of the field, who fractured some ribs a few months ago um, and has been, you know, spent a lot of the, the summer break recovering from that. She actually did finish P2, but she had a five second penalty for a false start that knocked her down to p5 but she made up for it by winning the second race that that put her at the top step of the podium with vug in p2 and abby pulling um in p3 and pulling just didn't have the pace to to get um to get vug and like that was the podium that like we expected iterations of that specific podium of of pawn vug and, and pulling like some sort of variation throughout the season after the the first couple of races so it was funny that we were um, back to all that and then also in race two Aurelia Nobles before she had that impact with Gaidman um, she did what Fernando did at Monaco a couple years ago and, like just backed up like the entire rest of the field behind the the lead pack so where does that put us for drivers standing and constructors then after this weekend so driver standings pulling is still way ahead. She's got 190 points. She's very solidly in the lead. But if Pawn con continues to be taking race wins from her, we could see a battle down the line. We have officially made the midpoint. Um, we had race seven and race eight of 14 this weekend. So there's still a lot of points left up in the air, but not that much as we go, you know, down through the, the rest of the schedule. Chloe Chambers, the American Haas driver, is in P3. She's got 89 points. A little bit of Anonymous this weekend, but she did still, you know, have, um, I think one points finish. Um, and then Nerea Marti is in fourth with 85 points. And then Vug is only um, in fifth by one point. She's got 84. So there's a lot, it's very tight up at the front and we can see a lot of movement as we go through these next few weeks. And then for constructors, did we get movement there or is it still the same? Yeah, we did get some movement in constructors. Um, Road and Motorsport, uh, they, uh, they're maintaining their lead. They, they're they pushing ahead. Prema um, over to Compos because um, Compos was in P2 going into the weekend. And then I believe, and I forgot to check this, but I believe MP Motorsport overtook ART Grand Prix. So those two teams, A, you know, MP Motorsport is 100 points back of Campos. MP Motorsport is the Red Bull, like the full Red Bull team, uh, but they they only have 92 points and then um, ART Grand Prix has 91. So like they're way behind those top three teams in the constructors. But those, yeah. So those two are way behind, but they're really close with it, with each other. With each other. Yeah. So we can see, you know, a lot of movement, you know, just de depending on who scores what and when, but it's wide open constructors wise for, you know, Rodin, Prima and Compos. And their next race will be in Singapore at like the end of September, so the September 20th. Yeah. So, so we have um, Singapore will be an interesting race for them. For, that's for a, them, that's for everyone. Them race there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, I think though. it's, it's, it's going to be really cool. Like that's just such a fun track. And like, I know Susie like managed to pick like all the best race weekends for this season for yeah, cause Susie the Academy. Is the best. She's yeah, so like she's she's really doing a, like every 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 week she just comes up with like some new major massive partnership and like you know the female quotient who sponsored the wild card driver this weekend like they're gonna continue being partner with F1 Academy throughout and she just keeps bringing like women focused women owned organizations into Formula One Academy and just really bringing more women into motorsport and this is a great way to do it. Oh, yeah, love. So before we drop i do want to just say one thing that we didn't cover that i think is really important for us to talk about coming up of that because it's tying into Susie bringing all these great sponsors right one of them that she pulled is the is tommy hilfiger we've said we love the tommy car it's super super cool so tommy hilfiger is a sponsor of mercedes <laughs> do you know where i'm going with this i think so <laughs> is a sponsor of mercedes and you can see george and lewis wearing you know Tommy Hilfiger stuff all the time. Well, if you caught one of their fan fest interviews, Lewis was in a full like red puffer. It was awesome. Loved yeah. it. And someone was like, um, are you already like leaving the team? And is that Ferrari red? Like what, what's going on with the red jacket? And he's like, no, 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 it's Tommy. It's Tommy. Yeah. So he's like wearing a full on Ferrari red Tommy Hilfiger puffer, which was super cool. Loved it. Um, 
But I just thought that was a really funny moment when he was like, no, 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 please don't hate me. It's just the sponsor. I'm not leaving yet. This is actually sponsored. This, right. you know, this, is, this is the Mercedes team partnership. No, that that is, I, I, I saw that. I, I definitely got a chuckle out of it. I and mean, that, that is a that is a great off track moment of the weekend for us. Yep. There you go. There you go. Perfect. And I hate, I can't believe I'm saying this. And I want to like take the words and shove them back down my mouth without even speaking them. Um, speaking of sponsorships, though, George Russell, his on-track sunglasses during the national anthem are always so cool. And I hate that I like something about George, but if it's only his sunglasses, I can live with myself. But I don't know if you caught them, but they're really cool. And I don't know what brand they are. I don't, are. I don't know if awesome. I saw them. I don't know I really if I saw like them, them, but... Yeah, no, I'm sure I, I was. We'll go I look at well, pictures. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to like. You'll have to send me send me pictures. But yeah, I I thought you know it's the fashion this weekend was it was very interesting. Obviously, you know, being in the desert, I'm like, why are you all wearing cashmere? It's so hot here. Like, it's it's hard enough for me. Like going to an event in a hockey rink tonight. Like, I'm like, I need I need a jacket. Where are my jackets? Are any of my jackets clean right now? Like, that's the crisis that I'm going through. But see, here's the thing. My friend was in Zandvoort this weekend. She went to the race and she was in a t-shirt and sunglasses and a hat. So that just goes to show George Russell had no business wearing a turtleneck <laughs> sweater with long pants and a long dress, dress coat. Like that does not, no. I was it just the George. weather today or no. like all weekend? All weekend. No. I don't know about that. Cause like I saw the, the weather before the F1, the first F1 Academy race when it was postponed, like that weather was Kevin, bad. It, it was not long overcoat weather. I don't care what you say. <laughs> I don't know. I get cold easily. So like, who knows? Oh my gosh. No, I, I can't. It, that is like my biggest pet peeve. And maybe it's cause I lived in South America and everyone brought their puffers out when it dropped below like 70 degrees. Like people were in like their Uggs and their puffers and like all wrapped up with their scarves and their mittens. And it's like 67 degrees out and I'm in shorts. Maybe that's where my, my beef comes with it. But maybe I don't understand George and his fashion. Anyways, moving on, we have Monza next, which I'm very yep. excited for. The Tifosi will be out in full force. This is always a really, 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 really fun race, especially for me as the you know token Ferrari fan of the podcast. TBD where alliances will be next year. Next we'll season. see. For now, I'm the Ferrari fan. Um, and we will have our Monza prediction episode out next week at some point dot 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 <laughs> probably thursday honestly it'll be whenever i'm done editing it which means also like within an hour of the official announcement of kimmy antonelli is probably when the episode's going to come out but it'll be out like thursday night friday morning listen to it when you wake up you know on friday morning you know as you have your you know coffee or whatever it is people drink in the mornings um and we'll just never get this timing right ever well, timing it, timing is hard. It's just, you know, we're, we're all busy, you know, going and doing things. And by we, I mean you, because I'm home from camp now and my, my schedule is what is, is a lot wider open than, than it has well, been all summer. That. It's just like, I think it's the timing between Europe and here because also when that. we wake up, it's like 5 million big things have already happened. Yeah. So we're playing catch up. So every day, every single day. Anyways, that has been our Zanvoort wrap up episode recap Dutch Grand Prix if you will thanks for going off track with us guys <laughs>